Hello, welcome back to Drawing Me Out. Uh, this is Elementals Part 2. Um, at the point I'm shooting this, or Brad's shooting this, and I, you know, am here in the room, uh, we do not yet know what episode number this is going to be. It might be episode 4, following straight on the footsteps of Elementals Part 1. But it might not be. Uh, we'll see. And at this moment, I'm going to do a little bit of shameless promotion while Bill keeps going on his sketch. Um, just a reminder, at this point, you've had a couple episodes to watch. Hopefully you're commenting, you're letting us know what's going on, what you like, what you don't like. But also, hopefully, you're commenting and asking questions. We do look at those, and from here on out, we're going to start including those in subsequent videos. If you want to know like what art supplies Bill uses or anything about what's going on, let us know in those comments below. We do read each and every one of them uh, and we will respond to them because now we've got, we've got that backlog of stuff going on to respond to. So well, we can't say we do read each and every one of them yet because at the time, this is the last of the uh, episodes that are being recorded uh, before the first has gone up. That's true. So we have no comments yet. So to say we read each and every one of them, well, I guess it's true. We have read each and every one. At which this is point, we have zero. read every comment that's been posted on this YouTube channel, correct? We indeed will read each and every one. Even you naysayers, you people that use the internet for uh, a place to say terrible things, uh, knowing that... Uh, we will not be coming to your house to punch you. Uh, what are they called? Even people, you. goblins, trolls, imps, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Uh, we may not necessarily respond to you rabble rousers, but uh, we'll read you until we block you with extreme prejudice. Can you block people on YouTube, or is that just a Twitter thing? Oh, let's find out. Okay. Or let's not. I mean, you know. Hopefully, they'll be civilized. Everyone will be civilized and pleasant. Excellent. All right. All right. So we were talking about the you were talking about, and I was listening about the elementals and and how they, you know, for lack of a better term, accidentally came to be as a series. Yes, the elementals came to be by accident uh, because I thought I was just demonstrating my ability to draw, uh, when in fact unbeknownst to me most of all, I was pitching a new series called The Elementals. One thing before I launch into that, you may be wondering, where's that scattering of, uh, of paint tubes <laughs> that was right in this position? Well, uh, they had to go. They went back in the drawer. They, they didn't go-go. But the reason they had to go is that I'm, I'm doing some more color work than... Uh, for some time and uh, as I'm opening the different tubes of paint needing different color I notice something see this permanent red listen to this that paint inside that tube is dry not so permanent it's then. a maraca now <laughs> um, why what is it about this tube that it, it doesn't actually keep the contents uh, wet and moist is like, you know, is it just a function of time? I think, I think if it's sealed and it seems sealed, but anyway, my watercolors were drying out. So time to re up. Brad, what was your question? It was a, it was a great question. It was, it was about the accidental uh, appearance of the, the, uh, the elemental and how they move forward into the Kamiko time. Okay. So, Noble Comics was going to publish The Elementals. At Noble Comics, we got as far as uh, creating the 20-page introduction to The Elementals that you will eventually see in uh, Justice Machine Annual number one, guest starring The Elementals. But that didn't happen with Noble Comics because in the production of that, now Noble Comics was doing something that uh, other comics companies 
just out of the gate weren't doing so much of, which is paying a pretty decent page rate right out of the gate. So as I was producing the 20 pages that we're going to go into the Elementals Introduction in Justice Machine Annual Number 1, um, I was getting paid. That was nice. But because of that, uh, and because Justice Machine Annual Number 1 was such a huge book, or was going to be such a huge book, um, a lot of money was going out, and uh, not any money for that was coming in. And this was a family operation. This was Mike Gusevich and his wife paying out of pocket to get this stuff done. The financing of that came from Mike Gusevich uh, was a terrific anchor. Uh, my first real contact with professional uh, working cartoonists. He taught me a lot about how comics are produced. But he was getting a lot of work at the time. Uh, from First Comics, which had just uh, started up, and uh, from Marvel Comics, who had just done, uh, just started a book called The New Mutants. Uh, Mike was the first, I believe, uh, anchor on The New Mutants uh, comic. As a result, some of my first professional comic work was on the first issue of New Mutants, uncredited, because uh, if you're going to learn the comic business from the ground up, you are going to help an anchor fill in blacks, uh, which is the, like this, the large black areas that an anchor would just fill in. What he would do is just outline it with his brush, then draw an X in the middle of it, and then get his handy assistant to do the tedious work of just actually filling it in. So I filled in a lot of blacks in my first days in Grand Rapids uh, on the New Mutants. So in that sense only, I did break into Marvel. You said that was right when New, New Mutants was starting? Yes. So I'm thinking late 82 or early 83. You can, you can check. Brad checks everything. And then through his wizardry of uh, web foo or whatever we're calling it these days, uh, right in this little box here in which things pop up, you're going to see something to do with new mutants pop up. But uh, hopefully the very first one, which I worked on. I may have uh, filled in blacks for the second uh, two, or there was a, it was introduced as a big, um, were we using the term graphic novel then? I'm not sure, but a big oversized trade paperback. Uh, yeah, but an original one, you know, uh, oh, okay. published for the first time. So it may have been that. Uh, my memory is not what it used to be. And even when it was what it used to be, it was pretty bad. Um, so that was my first comics work in actual comics, as in, you know, the stuff published for purposes of comics. Uh, back in my TSR days, the Dungeons and Dragons people, I did do a series of ads, uh, featuring Dungeons and Dragons, uh, and they were done as a comic strip. Um, so one could say that was my first comic work. And I was proud of those ads. Uh, the first one that was in Epic Illustrated was uh, in the same issue that featured a giant interview with Barry Windsor Smith. And uh, I, I was and continue to be a huge Barry Windsor Smith fan. Uh, so I thought that was pretty spiffy. Um, I don't know. The, the first uh, regular comics 
D&D ad uh, was in every comic for whatever month that was. Uh, so I can't quite point you to that one. I'm going to I'm going to take the reins and kind of kind of steer us back on track here and you were talking about how you were doing that and that was the funding for the uh for Oh the right right right. Yeah. That, that's I, I did digress, was. didn't I? Yeah. Did I not? Um so he was funding it out of his own pocket. And then one day when they had spent a whole lot of money on this Justice Machine annual number 1 and no money had come in from it because of course Money comes in from it after it's actually printed and published. So the whole thing was done, and all that was left was the printing and publishing, the shipping, the distribution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The stuff that actually generates the income. I believe it was Sue Fillmore, may have been both of them, took a look at all that money they'd spent and panicked. It was not money coming out of my pocket, so I have no right to say that this was the right reaction. But they called us together, and at my house, all of the uh, Noble Comics guys were called together. Jeff Loeb's and Bill Reinhold were in uh, Chicago and Detroit, respectively, so they weren't there. But Jeff D. had come into town to get onto this uh, Noble Comics gravy train by that time, so he was there, and I'm not sure who else, but uh, but Mike Gustavich and uh, Sue Fillmore called us into my apartment. I moved out of the guest room by this time, and said we're closing down Noble Comics because it's all money going out and no money coming in. And I think we may have even made the argument then that, well, money will be coming in as soon as this, you know, gets out there. I think they might have seen the printer's bill, which, even though they didn't have to pay it immediately, um, before they uh, start the printing job, the printer will basically tell you how much it's going to be. And for that huge book, the printing bill was as high as it's ever been. Plus, since these books were one of the independents, the new independents that were being done in color, uh, the color separation bill, which had already been handled, was huge. So they were a little skittish, and they said, you know what, it's silly to be paying out of pocket to do this stuff, especially when Mike is getting so much good Marvel work. So we're just going to do that for for now, and tra-la-la, Noble Comics is dead. And that was that. Well, by that time, enough word had gotten out about this Justice Machine Annual number one that different companies were interested in it. One of the new companies, starting right out again, was this group of comic retailers and uh, some artists and various uh, Houston area comics guys down in uh, Houston, Texas. And they had just created a new comic company. It wasn't named then, but it eventually got named as Texas Comics. One of the names a uh, considered, I had actually preferred, which was Third Coast Comics. But they didn't listen to me. They eventually landed because their first project was going to be to uh, to do both Elementals and uh, Justice Machine uh, as regular uh, monthly series. And their first project was going to be we have that whole Justice Machine annual featuring the elementals with a Mike Golden cover just sitting there waiting to be printed. So our first job is going to be printing that. They decided to lowball the print run. I'm not sure why. So they actually printed fewer 
of those than they could even get their own money back from. I guess it was going to be a lost leader to promote the two regular ongoing series. So they printed just the machine annual, and uh, the world knew about the elementals, finally. There was some good reaction. I even did a few conventions as a pro for the first time in my life. I'd done a few conventions where I'm one of those legions of, of unpublished kids, you know, doing sketches for cheaper than the guest at the convention who actually is a published guy charges. Uh, I'd done that for a while. This was my first convention as a pro um, with a published comic. The big name guest was Walter Simonson, who was one of the truly great men of comics in, in the sense of talent, but by golly, he's one of the nicest guys you'd ever meet. He he was probably on that list of Fantagraphics, published one year as a bit of snark in the comics journal of people that are too nice to actually be in comics. Uh, he is and remains a fine fellow. And uh, since that time, he had married his uh, sweetheart, uh, Louise Jones, who's now Louise Simonson, a uh, terrific editor at Marvel. Actually, but she never gave me work at Marvel at a time when she was in a position to do so. So boo hiss, Louise <laughs> Simonson. Um, I sat through the day with uh, Walter Simonson as uh, he gave me a valuable lesson, not formally, but uh, I was just paying attention, on how pros conduct themselves amongst the public. One of my first fan letters wasn't a fan letter it was a excoriation letter from someone who was at that show and basically said, how dare you be there with the great Walt Simonson and you haven't done anything. And yet you're like, lordy, 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 I am <laughs> such an important fella. Um, I, ha I, I don't think I was acting like an arrogant butthead. But the problem with arrogant buttheads is there's not a lot of self-realization uh, in them. So, like every other arrogant butthead in history, it may simply have been a case of, I was indeed acting like an arrogant butthead, but not aware of it, because I was all that and into myself. Anyway, that was part of my lessons on how to conduct it. I didn't agree with the fellow. I thought he was being a little over the top. It did cause me to sort of reevaluate conduct in public, which is a an ongoing thing. You should always, always be evaluating the nature of your conduct in public. Uh, just like a car needs regular servicing, you should revisit that in your mind every once in a while. Right, so, so anyway. I, yeah, I'm going to kind of pull it back to... Okay, to, pull it back. Yep. Kamiko and, well, it was uh, actually Texas, and they undersold the initial print run, you said? Right. So they couldn't make their money back on this, but they were going to make their money back, I guess, eventually when they sold other comics for profit. It was a, it was a loss leader. It was advertising. Problem is, uh, Texas Comics was not well-funded either. So right after publishing... Justice Machine Annual number one, they went belly up. I don't know if they gave a good speech the way uh, uh, Mike and Sue did for uh, Noble, but they went belly up. And I, because apparently I always moved to the town in which my books are going to be published. I was living in Houston at the time, and I was about to be homeless because I had no income. But lo and behold, other companies tried to, to make a play for Let Us Do Elementals. Um, Justice Machine Annual Number 1 did exactly what it was designed to do, which was show that this thing exists. It's out there, and it's pretty good. Um, 
or at least I thought so. So a lot of companies tried, and uh, amongst them was Cameco, a company I'd never heard of in uh, the Philadelphia area, actually Northtown, Pennsylvania, but uh, most of the artists and such working with them or for them lived in the Philadelphia area or just over the river in Jersey. They were among those that were trying for it. And this time I knew enough. I actually went out there to Philadelphia to hear their pitch. Uh, on their dime, very good. Uh, I learned enough by this time to pay attention to financing. I wanted to know about their publishing plans and this and that. But what I really wanted to know was, do you have enough money to do this? And without giving away private matters of some of the partners of Kimiko, uh, the answer was they did and they were able to demonstrate that. They were not going to go broke publishing their first comic. As a matter of fact, they'd already published their first comic. They'd done a, a few black and whites by that time. Uh, but their first full color comic was coming. That was going to be mage number one. Um, and also amongst their first comics was uh, going to be Evangeline, uh, kind of a killer assassin nun, I believe in a dystopian future. Uh, don't hold me to that. Um, which was pretty good, except I guess the uh, creators of that uh, had ir irreconcilable differences with the publishers, so it didn't last very long. Uh, and also, The Next Man by Vince Argandesi. I loved Vince Argandesi. I tried to love The Next Man. For one thing, it was a great name for a book. Only a few of them came out. Vince Argandesi was, was a disciple of Jack Kirby, and his work, his best work, looked like kind of rushed Jack Kirby. Uh, that is not necessarily a complaint. He liked Jack Kirby. And so the next man, which was about a guy in the future, he had a little floating robot that would help him zap his enemies, etc. I don't remember much about it. I do remember that Rich Rankin, who uh, also was inking the elementals for first comics, uh, was an inker on the next man. And so pages from Vince Argandesi would come into the studio we shared. And some of them were so um, rushed or kind of free form that we couldn't quite understand what it was on a given panel that uh, he was supposed to ink. Uh, the one I remember most, we would, we would get together, me, Rich Rankin, uh, Janet Jackson, not the one you're thinking of, the one that was a colorist for a while, uh, Matt Wagner, others. That we'd gather around these pages and try and guess what it was a picture of. I remember this uh, one... It was either a close-up of a guy's face or a long shot of a freeway where a truck <laughs> is getting stamped on by a giant boot. I don't want to see that guy's face. Um, I forget what it actually was. But anyway, those were the first books by Kimiko. Uh, then Elementals was going to join that. Elementals did. Much of the artwork for the very first issue had been done during the Texas Comics days. So we had most of the book done. We came out with that number one. Uh, it made a splash. I think it sold 50,000 copies, which is darn good for an independent, uh, especially an independent superhero book, although not too many people were doing that kind of thing. So it wasn't a big area of comparison. But it did well. And I thought, all right, this is pretty good. I didn't realize how good it was going to be until um, there was a contest. Uh, 
backing boards and comic bags. I forget who the uh, the biggest supplier or maker of backing boards and comic bags for comic supplies was at the time. But they ran, not a contest, one of those millionth customer kind of promotional things. Uh, when they sold their one millionth comic bag, they made a big deal out of who bought that which was this uh, little comic store in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I forget your name, guys. I apologize. But uh, they had a big write-up uh, about them in the Comics Buyer's Guide, which at the time was pre-internet. It was the weekly newspaper. That was where the source for information back it then. It was indeed. That, yeah. um, and, of course, someone asked the question, okay, congratulations, you've just become the, the millionth comic bag customer. What book is going into that bag? And they replied, Elementals number one, we love that book. Boy, talk about wonderful free advertising. You can't buy that kind of publicity. We couldn't. Elementals number two uh, gained like 30,000 sales because of that. So I love those people. And I said to them, I will come and do your store. Uh, so I did their store uh, to help thank them for promoting Elementals and, and getting it off to the races. And also because it was in Kalamazoo. You know the song, the song I'm thinking of. I've got a gal in Kalamazoo. I wanted to have a gal in Kalamazoo. So I did their store, and I also spent that time flirting like you would not believe with every woman I met just so that I could go back to Philadelphia legitimately singing, I got a gal in Kalamazoo. Didn't work, but Elementals was a success. It continued to be a success for the next five years. Only dropping down when the books stopped coming out. Why did the books stop coming out? Why did the books stop coming out? I'm glad you asked. It was my fault and it wasn't my fault. Uh, here's another thing I learned about the comics business. Kamiko was a new company learning business at the same time I was a new cartoonist learning the business of being a professional in the comics business. Kamiko had a pretty complex uh, contract, which they would hold us to. But like many comic companies, the big ones as well as the small ones, the things they're responsible for in a contract were considered, oh, helpful suggestions. We'll do this if we can get around to it. Whereas the things we were responsible for were, oh, my God, you better get that done or else. Whenever they would get up to hijinks, with the deals or this or that. I would get their attention by stopping work, which was the only real kind of clout I had. That worked in the sense of getting their attention to, okay, let's fix whatever it is going wrong here and get back to it. Problem with that is that worked only after, you know, they missed shipping an issue or two or what have you. And here's something I found out about the comics business. And for those of you who are in the comics business and those of you who are trying to be in the comics business, take heed about this. Uh, this will be the, the last thing I'll leave you with today. When you don't have a book coming out, the customers, the store owners, the readers who go in once a month and expect to see their book will never presume, wow, that comic company must be screwing up again, and Willingham has stopped work to get their attention. Nope. <laughs> they will presume only that the writer, artist, whomever, both in this case, is a lazy bum and is not working. When Coventry stopped because I could no longer afford to keep doing it for the very low pay at uh, Fantagraphics, Fanographics was not blamed by the people who missed Coventry. I was. I should have learned the lesson with Kamiko. If you 
stop working. If you have any part in the comics not coming out, you're the only one that's going to get blamed. Is that right? I don't know. But it is what's going to happen. You are going to take a hit on your reputation and what have you if you act like that for any reason. Especially if you do just legitimately screw up at some point because you have no no built-up fount of goodwill to say, okay, he's late, he's slow, whatever, but... He's usually, you know, Johnny on the spot, so we'll we'll let him slide. Nope, you can spend that goodwill pretty quickly, and then pretty quickly you have nada. And that is why my reputation in the comics business for being a kind of fly-by-night, can't-get-things-done, don't put your trust in this fellow, much of which was well-deserved, but that's where that got started, and uh, it took a long time to overcome it. When I say it took a long time to overcome it, you never overcome it. Uh, that reputation still follows me. So take heed, all you new guys or guys thinking about, you know, setting the uh, the publishers back on the right track by having a work stoppage lockout, walkout. It may work, but it causes much more damage than it fixes. And with that, I'm going to finish this sketch. Excellent. Well, we appreciate everyone who's, who's still watching with us. We appreciate everyone who's getting us out there to your friends. And like I said, get into those comments and talk to us. We're, okay. We're going to listen. Uh, like, share, and subscribe. Please do that angry yet red button down below is our lifeblood. Please hit that subscribe button. Please hit that like, whatever that is. Tell your friends. And if you hated this episode and the others, if you think that uh, uh, we provide nothing of value, then tell your enemies. I mean, you know, waste his time by saying, oh, look at this. Look at this show. And then... And then laugh quietly to and yourself. And laugh quietly to yourself. <laughs> or loudly. Yeah. You know, like a pirate. Uh but thank you very much. Um, we will be back next time with a new subject. And in the meantime, this finished sketch, uh, Brad, will you get this on the eBay? I will. The link's going to be down in the description below uh, when it goes live. All right. Thank you very much. And we're going to let Bill Willingham draw us out. Draw us out. Yes, I will.